Have a timer because I have well I created this uh, lecture or whatever you can call it yesterday because after a meeting with the uh, guys uh, a couple of weeks ago they uh, literally stripped me from my ideas so um, I had to figure out something to talk about so in that process I only created 80 slides <laughs> I think we'll manage that that will leave me 15 seconds for each slide so I'll just put my timer on so uh, this is my coffee shop. I was asked to uh, talk a little bit about how I created my uh, global brand as Tim Wendelbo. Uh, I don't really like to talk too much about myself, so I'm going to go through quickly. I started working in uh, Stockflitz uh, at the Parliament uh, about 16 years ago. I didn't drink coffee, I didn't like coffee, uh, I didn't know what a coffee shop was. This is my temporary job, and it still is my temporary job 16 years later. Um, yeah, but I started working there. I started running uh, the shops together with a friend of mine. We started opening more Stockflit shops. Uh, but, you know, after a while I thought that was not challenging enough. Uh, running six stores with 60 employees, not challenging enough. Um, very early on I started competing. This is how I looked like as a teenager. Um, I started competing in uh, barista uh, competitions, which was created here in Norway. And of course, since it's created here, we were the first ones to compete, so I did quite well. Um, after two years competing in uh, the World Championship, uh, I came second uh, for the second time. And uh, you can see how happy I was. <laughs> I think this was, my, this was the start of my professional career, because up until then, this was in 2002, up and, or 2000, yeah. Uh, up until then, I've been uh, really uh, full of myself, thinking I knew everything about coffee. Not winning the championship for the second time in a row, that was pretty damn hard. So I decided to go to Italy uh, to learn. Uh, and boy, did I learn. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the machine manufacturer, I went to roasters, and uh, yeah, that's how you sort of change this guy to become this guy. Um, 2004, I uh, managed to win the World Championship in Barista, uh, much thanks to getting a punch in the face and starting all over again and trying to learn what is coffee all about. Uh, winning the championship led me to travel around the world doing seminars. This is in Korea. Uh, you know they're all crazy with big posters and stuff like that. Uh, I also managed to travel to Origin, where coffee is actually grown. Believe it or not, it's not grown in Italy or in France. It's grown in the tropics. Uh, and that sort of led me to opening this store. Because every time I did a training, every time uh, I traveled, I found out that I needed to find better coffee. I needed to get my hands on better coffee. I needed a place where I could teach people about this great coffee. So that's why I opened the store, because there, there's no, nothing better than uh, educating the public. Uh, if the public understands what we're doing, then I will have a job in the future. So a lot of people ask me, what's my secret? And I realize coffee might not be food to you guys, but uh, it is actually a cherry. Uh, so for me, it's technically a food. You can eat the cherry. But what's my secret? Uh, how do you make a great cup of coffee? Anyone knows? You start with a clean brewer, you have fresh coffee, so-so. That's not how you do it. So I'm going to give you the secret right now. In uh, 17 minutes, hopefully. <laughs> coffee, as you might know, is grown in the tropics. Uh, so in order to make good quality coffee, you need good quality ingredients. And where do you find good quality ingredients? You find it where the coffee is grown. You don't find it in a supermarket. 
you'll never find a good quality ingredient in the supermarket. You don't do it with fish, you don't do it with meat, you don't do it with coffee. Simple and easy as that. So for me, if I wanted to make the best cup of coffee in the world, of course I had to go to origin. And what better way to start in Kenya and Ethiopia, where it all started, where the coffee is from, where the coffee tastes fantastic, almost by default. I started going to Central America, uh, mainly because the farmers there are quite professional. Uh, they know what they're doing, but you also have small farmers there who doesn't know what, anything about coffee. They just do whatever their parents taught, taught, taught them to. Brazil, biggest coffee producer in the world. And then I ended up in Colombia, which is probably one of my favorite origins, apart from Ethiopia and Kenya. And the reason why I started working in Colombia to get better ingredients is because the potential is huge. They have everything. They have the climate, they have the altitudes, they have the soils, they have everything. And they have over 500,000 producers. So the chance for finding one producer that is truly doing a great job should be quite big, right? Out of 500,000. Well, it turns out most of these farmers do mainly the same thing, you know? They have the same soil, they have the same climate, so it's all about finding a guy that has the right attitudes. And five years ago, I met this guy. <laughs> he looks a little bit like Maradona. <laughs> and if you ever see a guy with a shirt open in Colombia, the chance it's this guy is very big because he always wears his shirt up. This is Elias. I met him five years ago, uh, but I didn't start working with him until last year. Uh, the reason why I decided to work with him is because his attitude is right. He's not the most creative guy because he's just working so hard every day to make his farm run and go around. So he doesn't have time to think about, okay, what if I did it like this? What if I did it like that? And so on. But for me, it was a good uh, opportunity because he had just bought a huge farm last year. Uh, and the problem in Colombia is that a lot of the farms are very small. So even if you do a lot of work with the farmer, you might just end up buying two, three, four bags of coffee. So you need a certain size in order to at least get a little bit of volume uh, in order to be able to sell the coffee in Norway. So I found the right guy. Now it's time to find the right variety. Did you know that you probably heard of Arabica and Robusta coffee. Did you know that there are over two, three thousand different Arabicas? No, nobody knows. Not all of them taste great. Some of them taste great. Some of them taste better in Brazil than in Colombia and so on. And this is only one species of coffee. You have maybe a hundred other different species as well. But maybe they don't taste good. They're not commercially grown and so on. So finding the right variety for his specific farm, uh, you know, that's going to take me 20, 30 years. Because you plant the seeds, it takes five years, you harvest, you plant new seeds, then you harvest again five years after, and then you can start making some coffee, and then you can start tasting, is this good coffee or not? Planting takes a little uh, timing. Uh, it takes about nine months to get a plant after you plant the seeds. And yes, the coffee bean is actually the seed of the coffee plant. Then after you have uh, the plants, you have to decide should I have a low density farm or a high density farm, meaning how many trees per hectare should I have? Because this will influence the quality. It takes a little time to uh, develop, uh, but I'm sure that bigger uh, space between the trees gives more light and more nutrients for the tree. Hence, you get a better quality coffee, hopefully. I'm testing this. It's gonna take some years. Do you wanna grow organically or uh, artificial as I call it? Because uh, if you want to pay the same price that people are paying today, then organic farming is not very sustainable. But if you want to continue farming for 50 years, then organic farming is the only way. Otherwise, you don't have any soil that is healthy because you're only putting chemicals into it. Weeding. Such a simple thing as weeding can have a big impact on quality. Because if you kill the weeds with chemicals, you also kill the roots of the coffee tree with chemicals. So we really need to hire people to go and use the machete and cut all the grass. And then the grass becomes organic material and nutrients for the trees. Pruning, how do you cut the tree? 
the more primary branches you have on a tree, the more dense coffee beans you get, hence you get better quality. And the reason for this is the nutrients in the trees are more available for the cherry. If you have a branch attached to the primary branch and then one attached to that one again, you get lower density beans, hence you get lower quality. This takes time for teaching the farmers because if you cut away a lot of branches, they lose a lot of coffee. You cut away the tree. Picking. Probably the most difficult part of growing coffee is to pick ripe coffee. It sounds a little stupid, but uh, coffee is actually hand-picked. And I spent over a week teaching the pickers at this farm in Colombia how to pick only ripe cherries. And it's not possible, actually, because then you would have to visit the trees at least once a week to pick every week from the same tree. So you need to pick a little bit of unripes. You need to pick the overripes, because otherwise they fall to the ground. If you don't pick the semi-ripes, they will be overripe when you revisit the tree and so on. So it's really hard to train the pickers. This is what it would look like on a coffee tree. If this was strawberries, you would never pick the green ones, right? You only want the red ones, because you know that those taste great. Well, for the pickers, they don't really care about this, because they only get paid per bucket. So the faster they can pick, the more money they get. So we need to raise the price for the pickers. We need to teach them how to pick only ripe. And we need to make them sort the coffee, not only while they're picking, but also after they're picked. They need to sort the coffee before the coffee is delivered for processing. This costs money, of course. But this is how you make a good cup of coffee, since you asked. <laughs> After the coffee is picked, you need to process the coffee. Uh, and you can do this in many ways, but before you even start processing, you need to make sure your equipment is clean. This was a clean machine at the farm when I came there. And of course, when you start looking at details, the devil is in the details, they say, but uh, when you start looking at details, one of these beans that are stuck there, if they get loose, and get into my cup of coffee when I quality control it, it will taste like a rotten fermented fruit, and I will not buy the coffee because of one bean. And that can be devastating for the farmer. So this is what it should look like. It's a kitchen. It needs to look clean. So when you start processing, how do you start? Uh, well, there are many different ways of doing it. I'll show you one way. A uh, good thing to do is to put the cherries in the water because you can get some soil off the cherries. So this doesn't taste very good, so you need to rinse the cherries a little bit. And then you actually get some cherries that float. These cherries will contain maybe one coffee bean or two small coffee beans or something like that. That is not the best quality, so they float. So you remove those. Then you take the good coffee cherries and you depulp them in a depulping machine, which is just uh, squeezing the cherries so the beans they jump out of the cherry. Then you put the beans. They still have a lot of sort of slimy mucilage on them, so you need to ferment it. And fermentation is really difficult because in Ethiopia they ferment for 72 hours under water. In Colombia they ferment from 12 hours to 24 hours without water. And the time, you know, you can't just set the clock and say, okay, in 12 hours it'll be ready. <coughs> Because it depends on how much mucilage, how much temperature, uh, how hot it is in the weather, how many bacteria, and so on. So the farmer really needs to go and check this product all the time. If it's over-fermenting, it'll taste like sour vinegar from the coffee. And you don't really want that. When the coffee is fermented, you have to wash the coffee. And of course you need access to clean water. Uh, so you're actually polluting a lot of water by producing coffee. So this is a very old-fashioned way of doing it, and we're trying to implement equipment that uses about 40 times less water than what's traditional. But the washing really takes off the excess mucilage, and you also have beans floating all the time. So you'll probably have 30% waste just floating down the stream, and that will be sold for internal market or whatever. We really just want the densest beans that are still stuck in the top of the channel. After the well, coffee is washed, I prefer to soak the coffee a little bit, put it in clean water, 
just to even out the moisture content. Because I really believe if you want to dry coffee evenly, the beans need to have the same starting point. So if you have a bean that has 50% moisture and 55% moisture, they won't dry at the same pace. So a little bit of soaking for 20 hours, 12 hours, that really helps. Then one of my big, uh, big, big improvements or, uh, for the last years is to improve the drying. If you put coffee on the soil, which is done in many countries, the coffee will also taste like soil. If you buy really, really cheap coffee in a producing country, it will taste this for sure. Uh, if you dry it in a solar dryer that is like a greenhouse, you will have a very humid climate and a very hot climate. And this is very efficient for drying the coffee for the farmer. But when the coffee arrives in Norway, it will have a different color. It will be sort of whitish in the beans and it will taste like wood. So you might as well just roll some wood chips and put it in the coffee cup. So this is how we prefer to do it. On some raised beds, we call them, uh, clean. Nobody's stepping on the coffee. There's no animals uh, pooing on the coffee. Put a little shade on top so you have a little bit less heat so you can revolve the coffee all the time. You have a guy raking the coffee so the coffee is dried evenly for up to 60 days instead of six days, which is normal. So this makes a big difference in how to make a better cup of coffee. You can clearly see the difference. This is the product before. This is sort of the waste product. And this is the clean product that we're producing now. Lot separation. Well, you have a farm, you grow coffee, you pick coffee more than once a year. Uh, you pick maybe for a three month period, you pick every day or a couple of times a week. And if you mix all these coffees together, it's like mixing a strawberry in a basket that you picked in June with one picked in August and making jam of it. It's not going to taste very good. So you need to separate all these lots into like two bags picked uh, on Monday, two bags picked on Tuesday. And then after a while, you, when you have a lot of lots, you cup them, taste them, and it builds bigger lots so that you're able to actually put them into a factory and, and bag them and so on. But this is not normal. Normally, the farmer will produce the coffee and sell it immediately because they need money to pay the pickers for next week. So pre-financing is one of the issues that is critical in order to maintain the quality because you want the farmer to do this job, but you don't want him to sell the coffee before you've tasted it. So lot separation is important. Storage. You need to improve the storage. You can't store it in a hot port, for instance, because the product will be ruined in a couple of weeks. So you need to make sure the temperature is not too high and also that the storage is clean. There's no birds in there pooing on the coffee and that the storage facility is organized so they don't mix your coffee with other coffees. Then it's time for the dry mill. Uh, this is a factory that sort of cleans the coffee and makes it, uh, prepares it for export. You sort the density, so the heavy beans, that's the one we want. You sort the screen size, so you have beans falling through different kinds of holes. You want the bigger beans, they normally taste better. You remo remove all these defects. The black beans are rotten stuff, they will taste rotten. You have ladies also picking out defects, you know, this takes a lot of time. And of course there's a lot of waste, you have to pay for that. Then you have to pack the coffee. Normally it's done in these traditional jute bags. They don't uh, taste good because the jute smells. It will influence the coffee. And it's also not airtight. So if you have a very humid condition, the coffee will gain humidity. So you need to pack them in vacuum or some kind of plastic bag. Then you need to sort out your storage at port as well. Do you need air condition or do you not? You need to sort out your shipping so the coffee is not stuck in the origin country. Do you want the container on top of the boat or in the middle or in the bottom? This greatly influences the quality. Then, of course, you have the quality control. You need to test the coffee that you got a sample of for buying and see if that matches the sample you actually received when the coffee came to Norway. Once you've done that and the coffee is approved, you start roasting it. But roasting is quite difficult. You can end up with the same color of roast in many different ways and it will greatly influence the flavor of the coffee. This is really, really difficult, but to be good, you need to be able to taste. Cooling the coffee. 
coffee needs to be cooled in less than five minutes after it's roasted. Then you need to pack it in sealed bags, nitrogen flushed, no oxygen, oxygen there. And we prefer to actually rest the coffee for a week before we start drinking it. Because fresh coffee tastes a lot of smoke and it's very bitter. Then you have to quality control the roast again. And then you can start thinking about brewing, which is probably where you thought I was going to start talking about. This is how you make a good cup of coffee. You need to uh, set the grind right, and how do you know this? Well, you can taste your way or you can measure your way, but also different grinders have different grind qualities. Some have very uneven grinds, some have very even grinds, and of course, the more even, the better. Uh, measure, always measure the dose. 60 grams per liter, uh, roughly, uh, is the filtered coffee dose. And if it's too weak, you just grind it a little bit finer. Rinse the paper filter. You don't really want to taste paper when you drink coffee, you want to taste coffee. Water quality, well in Norway we don't have to think about that, but in Denmark there's so much minerals in the water that it doesn't matter what coffee you put into your brewer, it will taste like shit anyway. Because <laughs> the water is dirty and it has too much calcium, so you lose all the acidity and you lose all the flavors. So you really need to take care of the water. Water is 98% of a cup of coffee, make sure that ingredients is good quality. Brew time, of course, if you brew for one minute or 10 minutes, it's gonna influence the flavor. Extraction, you can measure extraction. This is an iPhone app and you need a refractometer to measure, but this will greatly influence how you brew if you start measuring. You don't wanna extract more than 18 to 20%, so if it's too much, it gets very bitter. If you have extracted too little from the coffee, it will taste sour and weak. And then how you serve it, of course, do you serve it in solid form, liquid form, cold, hot? What kind of cup do you serve it in? What kind of personnel do you want to serve your coffee? This greatly influences the experience that our customers get in our shop. And of course, there's always room for improvement. And this is probably my biggest secret. I'm never satisfied with my cup of coffee. Once I get the coffee to Norway, I roasted it, I brewed it, I tasted it, I'm like, I could do this better. So, then you repeat. <laughs> and that's pretty much how uh, I would advise you to make a great tasting <laughs> coffee. <laughs> uh, one minute over time, that's okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs>